Buenas tardes. Vamos a, a reanudar el, las sesiones del Congreso. Welcome back, everybody. We are going to reassume the conference and we are going to do so with uh, uh, two people that you know so very well that I'm going to be making the briefest of presentations, okay? So, uh, please allow me to uh, to call to the table to, to introduce Elia, Elio Garcia and Linda Antonson, who are going to be talking about building the world of ice and fire. Uh, hace una presentación, como decía, de, de Elio y Linda en un foro de este tipo es absolutamente eh, baladí. Ya todos lo conocéis y lo que estáis deseando es que ellos hablen y yo eh, me calle rápido, así que os daré ese placer. ¿eh? Pero sí que hay algunos eh, asuntos que me gustaría decir. Primero, que tenemos en la mesa eh, con nosotros, nos acompañan dos personas de las que Martín ha dicho que saben más que sobre el mundo de Westeros que él mismo, lo cual para mí es todo eh, una garantía perfecta de, de éxito. Tienen además, eh, son las personas que, que dirigen el fansite Westeros, que como todos sabéis pues es el más potente eh, del mundo sobre, sobre la saga y eh, por último, a modo de introducción y, y hemos traído el libro para, para que lo veáis, pues son los que han hecho el companion, el, el libro fundamental firmado con, con Martin, el mundo de hielo y fuego que traemos aquí en la versión de lujo eh, en español y que, bueno, pues yo creo que son, eh, podría decir otras, ¿no?, pero son las garantías de que vamos a disfrutar hoy de una eh, conferencia mmm, magnífica y, y todos sé que estáis deseando, eh, pues, atender a, a lo que tengan que decirnos. Así que, without further ado, eh, thank you very much, Elio and Linda. Uh, thank you first to the organizers for inviting us and uh, to the university that uh, hosting us here. This is a fantastic thing. We're really excited to be able to participate in this. Um, Linda and I have been, you know, devoted fans of Sunrise and Fire for over 20 years now, and uh, collaborators of George for nearly 14 years now, and uh, it's given us a very uh, unique, I think, position. Uh, to see sort of how he works and what he's done. Um, we were, you know, he, I, I heard the quote there that George likes to say that we know more about Westeros than he does, and I would like to joke that uh, he's forgotten more about Westeros than we ever knew in the first place. Um, but we have some observations that we'd like to share regarding uh, the world building, George's approach to doing that, um, and, and some insights that we've had with working with him and how that helped shape you know, the world of ice and fire. We're going to broadly be speaking about three sort of main approaches and, and aspects of uh, Martin's world building. Uh, the first is the fact that George is you know, a great fan of historical fiction, and as such, he likes to use our own history to inform his work. We've seen that discussed in many of the panels here already, how various influences can be seen in the books and how that helps ground his story in a reality that we recognize. But then, of course, because it is a work of fantasy, there has to be that added element of the fantastic and of the sense of wonder, of, of the, the unique things that make the world of Westeros, the, the secondary world, something other than our own world. So we're also going to look a little bit at how George introduces those elements and what his thoughts are on how fantasy should be built, or one way of approaching adding the fantastical elements to fantasy. And finally, because George has often commented on the importance of the map and the world, that if you create a world that is living and breathing, it becomes a character in its own right. So looking at the maps of, of Westeros and of Essos, some of the different forms that they have taken over the years, also gives a certain insight into how he how he views the, uh, the creation of the secondary world. 
Uh, this is a slide we actually borrowed from a TED Talk where someone was talking about um, Game of Thrones and the War of the Roses. Drawing comparisons has been very popular because, as everyone knows, uh, the very start of a Game of Thrones and uh, sort of the history of the Roberts Rebellion is, is very much influenced by the conflict between the Yorks and the Lancasters over the throne of England. Um, this is this is not just George cheating. This is not just his finding a shortcut to to create a fantasy. It's integral to how he views the world building of a fantasy. Um, because while the genre is a fantasy and you can have magic, you also have to have rules. And by drawing from history, he creates rules that are implicit, but you start to understand them because, well, you know a little bit about the Middle Ages. Everyone does knights and castles, kings, priests. Um, Tom Shippey, who in the Road to Middle Earth, recently a guest, I believe, at the, uh, of the Spanish Token Society, uh, he borrowed a linguistic term called calc to describe how Tolkien took elements from our history, um, the Anglo-Saxons that were here and things like that, and applied them to Middle Earth. And he knows that this permitted Tolkien to present a history that was like unlike England, but the hobbits were like unlike English people. And this like unlike to us seems really key to how you construct a secondary world that is based in some part on the real world. History is basically, um, I guess you'd say like an intertext. Uh, when you, if you know the history and you see elements show up, you start realizing, you start filling in the blanks. George doesn't have to do all the legwork. It starts growing in your mind to answer these questions. And we've seen this over the years on the for 20 years, fans talking on forums, trying to understand, OK, we heard about this battle. How did this work? And people would say, well, you know, of course they used the Calvary to do this. This is how they always used Calvary to do this in the Middle Ages. And um, people would try to understand you know, the economics of Westeros. How does it work? Uh, and you know, we see many professors, that, and they would draw from history. They would try to explain it, because that's, they could see that that's what George was doing. George is not a historian. He's not a linguist. He's not an expert, but he is a, an amateur enthusiast, an amateur medievalist who has done a, a lot of research. Um, and through all of this, what ha what's happening, uh, and it's a term we're borrowing from, um, to quote uh, Darko Suvin, who's written about fantasy, uh, but all of this does, it, it helps to sort of mediate the relationship to our reality. The history that George uses in, kind of explicitly says, look, this, these characters may be in a fantastical world, a fantastical setting, but you understand their struggles because they're human. The rules are human. The way the conflicts work out are human conflicts. Of course, <laughs> George mixes his influences. It is not like you can take ah, this historical event, I knew how that one unfolded, so I will know exactly what is going to happen in the world of ice and fire. Uh, I know that he's taking influences from Venice when he's creating bravos, so we can look at Venetian history and know everything about bravos. That's obviously not the case. He, he doesn't like the idea that you should be able to read a history book and know exactly what happened. Uh, he's obviously himself a big fan of historical fiction, but when it came to writing it, while he wanted to apply some of the uh, elements of historical fiction to how fantasy was created, he's always been saying that um, I don't want the reader to be able to look, look up on Wikipedia and see, well, okay, the, the War of the Roses, well, it ended that way, so you know, I know exactly how this book is going to end. He wanted to avoid that, so while he will start, like the image here that we showed, um, with the, there's a relationship between um, the starting point of A Game of Thrones and some of the political situation of The War of the Roses. When the story develops, it's going to take you away from there. So it becomes a little bit similar to, in a sense, the way that Tolkien uses the Shire as the familiar place to start, and then you venture out into the greater world and 
it starts to become more and more different from what you know. He does some similar things when he uses history, that it starts on some familiar ground and then it starts changing. So everyone has probably by now heard of various famous events of, for example, Scottish history that he used for some of the more bloody events of Westeros. The, uh, the Red Wedding, for example, draws from two events of Scottish history, the, uh, the Black Dinner and the Glencoe Massacre, and neither matches up entirely with the elements of the Red Wedding, but you have the ideas of that there's a, a guest right, even though that concept is more an ancient Greek concept rather than uh, something that would have applied in Scotland <coughs> at the time, but the idea of, of guests who, uh, in this case, it, in the Scottish case, it is guests who decide to um, use the fact that they've been invited to uh, then attack their hosts. Uh, so he's using the idea of somebody who really should be safe in somebody else's house than being attacked, and also the, uh, the conflicts of... Um, you know, closing someone in into a, a hall and then, you know, you can't get away. And so he, he mixes and matches elements of these uh, events to create his story. But when you obviously, whether or not you know about these details, uh, for many people, they would have found out about them after reading the story. But it still adds then an element going forward. You might wonder, is there some more um, parallels that can be drawn, for example? So the main thing that the use of history does is that it, cre it creates this recognition and it expands your knowledge of Westeros by filling in, like Elio said, filling in some of the blanks with your knowledge of the Middle Ages, which for most people is not that deep. Most people have a, a sort of pop culture understanding of the Middle Ages or more precisely of what would be called medievalism, the, the trappings of the Middle Ages that have been popularized not just through the 19th and 20th century, but which starts at the very least in the Victorian era and probably even earlier, that people start romanticizing the Middle Ages and different images of the Middle Ages start showing up. And to some extent, George is able to to play with the fact that there are multiple images of the Middle Ages. Uh, he's, he's a fan of movies as well, and he's uh, cited a, a couple of different, um, I think it is the Camelot movie from the 50s, right? Uh, 60s. 50s or 60s, which is more of a, a technicolor version of the Middle Ages. You've got all the pageantry, the colors, the romantic Middle Ages. And then, of course, as you move forward, it's, you, we started getting um, what is called uh, hyper-medievalism, where everything suddenly had to be very gritty, very bloody. Uh, John Borman's Excalibur would be a, a typical example of that, of the, uh, the deep grittiness of that. And in The Song of Ice and Fire, George likes to contrast these two. We've got We've got the colorful banners, we've got all the pageantry, but at the same time, we've got the mud and the blood and the, uh, the brutal deaths. So he's using both these uh, conceptions of the Middle Ages. And uh, because he had obviously used so much of this in already creating the material that existed through the books, when it came to working on the world of ice and fire, we knew that we wanted to continue this idea of using um, history very much as a touchstone and, for example, the idea that it would be something a bit like a medieval chronicle or a medieval text, that it would have an in-world narrator and that he'd use sources that seemed like they were in-world sources and had a bit to do with how a medieval text might be constructed. In writing this fake history, as George calls it, um, the maester wasn't just an idea we ran with because it was appealing to continue that narrative. It also had a practical purpose. Uh, George didn't want to reveal too much that was relevant to the plot of A Song of Ice and Fire in this book, so he needed someone who was not omniscient who knew everything, and so obviously the answer was a maester. And a maester working in the present time 
of the novels because that immediately gave us so many things about we could look at the history of, of, of historians writing at, in the Middle Ages and after and how influenced they were by the political landscape. Everyone knows that um, Shakespeare's Richard III was very inspired very much uh, by uh, Hollinshead's Chronicle, Sir Thomas More's history of Richard, which was a post-Yorkist history that painted Richard III as this horrible villain. And that's the villain you get in, in, in the play. If, the York, if Richard III had won at Bosworth, the histories might have had him quite differently. So he thought, well, our maester, if he's working now, he's working Robert, the last year of Robert's reign. He's married to a Lannister. He's his, you know, Tywin Lannister who sacked King's Landing, is his father-in-law. What can I say about these people? Um, this dedication page that we wrote, uh, for the dedication, unfortunately you can't see it too clearly, is, is, is part of that fiction. We, he's dedicating it to the king, and the idea is he dedicates it to King, to king Robert. And as he's waiting to present to Robert, Robert dies. And it's a, it's a piece of parchment, so he scratches out Robert's name, and he puts in Joffrey's name. And he waits to present the book to, to Joffrey. Uh, and Joffrey's busy getting ready for his wedding. And then uh, Joffrey dies at his wedding, and he has to scratch out that name, and now is Tommen's name sitting there. Um, Our maester has not watched the show, <laughs> so he's still waiting to present it to Tommen. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> um, so we use that to our advantage to have a character who we could explain any lapses, any gaps, as being someone who, who has either a lack of knowledge or he disputes the knowledge that he has because he himself, he's a maester, he's not a witness. He's, he's someone who looks at books, like we look at the books, and tries to pick out the truth from them. Um, and the other thing is, is he someone who may have biases? He may have concerns, like keeping his head on his shoulders. If he writes the truth that Tywin Lannister brutally sacked King's Landing, and how Jaime Lannister betrayed his oath and killed his king, well, Cersei Lannister probably not going to like him too much. On the other hand, he thinks, well, there's no Dornish at court for obvious reasons. What if it was, what if those rumors that the mountain killed Elia Martell were false? What if, what if Elia, out of fear, killed her own children and then herself? Um, maybe that's the actual story. And that's what his book says. And we got a lot of grief for that one. A lot of people are like, how in the world could you come up with this horrible thing? But we said, you know, he's a person who is in the Middle Age, in, in the society that is a society where patronage matters, where, where nobles can decide life and death on a whim, he has to be careful. Having a maester, of course, then means he needs his sources. He needs his own sources. And so, again, looking at things like uh, Forsart's Chronicle and uh, various histories, you know, even we looked at uh, Herodotus and such, they're always citing other people. They're, they're, again, they're not witnesses to many of these things. They're interviewing people. They're taking texts from other books. So we started inventing sources. So we needed a source about giants. We invented some maester who had been doing an inventory of, of grave fields and, and so on. And George actually really loved this, where our, you know, especially when we were doing things like we would cite Septon Barth. And, the, and Septon Barth, if you don't remember, he was a very some kind of heretical Septon, uh, dabble in sorcery and forbidden knowledge. Uh, and he wrote very esoteric things, and, and our maester keeps kind of disapprovingly citing him, saying, oh, Barf would say these crazy things, but it's, it's not true. And then everyone kind of started realizing, whenever Yandel says that uh, Barf is wrong, Barf is probably correct. Um, but George loved it. George really enjoyed it, and in fact, he ended up doing it himself. When he started changing from writing little sidebars, which was almost immediate, to writing long, long uh, tens of thousands of words, when he did the Dance of the Dragons, that ended up being 60,000 words. And a key part of that is he decided, OK, yeah, our guy, or he created his own maester, Archmaester Gildane. Gildane is obviously not, he didn't live in the Dance of the Dragons. He's a scholar. He's using other sources. And, you, and so George created Mushroom, the court jester dwarf who has this very lurid uh, history. And then he has Septon Eustace, a much more pious man who has a very conservative view. And the, the Grand Maester Orwell, who is 
according to this, he's, to George, he's writing his history, his account of the conflict in prison, possibly to be executed. And he's basically trying to, he has his own bias, or while is trying to make himself look good to see if he, uh, you know, either save himself from being killed or at least save his legacy. Um, these all these all aspects of it all together, when the rules of fire engage the reader, when they start picking through the information and trying to see what's real, what's false, what's dependable, what's not. And it's the same with what George does with the history in, in the books. People have all these accounts. Sometimes they're conflicting. And you're trying to peer, piece through them. But just by being engaged in that puzzle, you're, you're engaging with the world uh, on that sort of the world building level. Um, Oh, I managed to jump ahead slightly, but okay. Uh, that then uh, that then leads to, I guess, the other aspect of the world, which looms large. Once you have grounded your world in reality, if you are writing a fantasy, you will want to add something of the fantastic. You'll want to make the world other in some way. Depending on the fantasy, that may vary quite a lot. Uh, for George, um, as the quote, which I hope you can manage to read up here, shows that he was very inspired by Tolkien's approach in that there shouldn't be fireball-wielding wizards running around and there shouldn't be a, a clear spell system where you learn to say certain things or do certain rituals and then it always works and you throw a fireball at your enemies. Uh, that makes the magic uh, in some ways more like a science. It takes away some of the mystery of the magic. And obviously there's plenty of fantasy where that approach works very well depending on your tastes for that. But for George, he wanted to make sure that the fantastic elements grew out of the world and fit with the world. So he has opted for a more realistic world and he wanted magic that just started very slowly, started seeping in through the world, and also the idea that the reader would not be completely overwhelmed by magic right away. Uh, one of the things when people uh, critique something like uh, A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones, perhaps more with the TV show saying that you might say that um, people are moving at unrealistic speeds and then you always get somebody countering, there are dragons in the show, why are you worried about how fast people travel? It's fantasy. So those who don't understand that there are rules to fantasy seem to often seem to think that just because it is fantasy, you can do whatever you want. But then you are going to lose the reader out of that carefully crafted immersion that you've hopefully managed to create. You've hopefully managed to get them to accept your secondary world as, as real as our world and accept that there are rules to this secondary world. And when something happens, you can obviously surprise someone, but if the surprise makes the reader or watcher go, hmm, this doesn't really fit, does it? Then you've lost them out of the immersion, if that is your intent, of course. Uh, so you create magical elements in something of the same way. Even if you don't have rules for your magic system, there are still rules to how it appears in the novels. And if we disregard the prologue of A Game of Thrones to start with, because obviously there the supernatural elements are very present, but the readers almost buy into what the, uh, the characters of the book to start with, they, they dismiss these events. And so the reader kind of starts, well, okay, We'll probably hear more about that later, but everyone seems to you know, not believe it for the time being. But even so, there is actually a slow introduction of fantasy elements, starting with Bran's first chapter. And there are these little details where he starts breaking away from the realistic. Um, a lot of the first chapter is very mimetic in the sense that you've got this young boy being taken to see 
the beheading of someone by his father, it's all sort of grounding you very much in a you know, fairly gritty medieval world that people, people would feel that, okay, this is not something you would do today, but it certainly feels like something people would have done in the Middle Ages, taking your child to see a beheading to grow up. Um, but then you start getting these little phrases like the night's watch and a sentence like it was the ninth year of summer and the seventh of Bran's life. They're at odds with the apparent realism of the scene. But in the context of the story, they're treated as nothing out of the ordinary. So the reader accepts them as part of the story's reality. And that's how he starts sneaking in the strangeness of Westeros bit by bit and convinces the reader to accept them. And these are typical, one could say, like, unlike elements. The, the, the part that Elio mentioned earlier, that Shippy mentioned for how the Shire is like, but also unlike England. There are things that are so familiar, and yet there are other things that stick out as a little unfamiliar but still you accept them because of the things that are familiar. Um, and it uses, to some extent, I guess, the idea of uh, the literary concept of defamiliarization, which uh, the Russian uh, uh, started using. I think it's, my Russian is terrible, but it's something like ostranenyi uh, is the term, which is basically the technique of presenting common things to an audience in strange or unfamiliar ways and that gives you a different outlook on the familiar. Um, it also helps create a certain tension in the narrative to drive things forward. Uh, and this leads into another quote from George, which is one of my favorite things that anyone has ever written about fantasy. Um, and it, particularly, he, he talks about how it is more real than real, that by adding these elements that are like yet unlike our world, that start off in our world but adds a touch of paint, a touch of color, a touch of, a touch of magic, it becomes something more. It is it's almost a, a weird sense of hyper-realism in that it is our world and yet something more. And that, I think, is uh, a very good way of describing the, um, the effect of the estrangement that it can have, the fantasy can have, where it's just a little bit different and it makes you engage with the story in a different way. Um, as we said earlier at the start, uh, one of the things that George said was that if, if he was doing his job right, the world itself would become uh, a character for you. And this quote, funnily enough, this quote is a, a recent one. It was uh, at a red carpet just last week for the Tolkien movie uh, that he said this. But in fact, in 2004 is the first time I ever met George personally. I had been visiting my family in the U.S., and I, we were passing through uh, New Mexico, and we arranged to meet him in, I, in Santa Fe, and that's, you know, we had a dinner of Paris and his wife and, uh, in a, some restaurant, and he shared the same anecdote about how the world, uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth, was the most popular poster on people's walls. Uh, it wasn't the characters, it was, it was Middle Earth itself. And that's what he, has, he strived to do. And that's the same dinner where he said, and by the way, you know, Ellie O'Linda, do you, wanna, do you guys want to write The Walls of Fire with me? So it, sticks, it stuck out in my mind. Um, maps in general, everyone agrees, pretty central to, to fantasy literature. Uh, thanks to Tolkien, most epic fantasies or genre fantasies will feature a map of these secondary worlds. Um, in fact, uh, this, with George's permission, this is a scan of the map. This is the original map, hand-drawn, messy lettering. He's, it's not in the archives at the uh, University of Texas A&M yeah. uh, yet. Uh, he still uses it, I, I gather. 
Uh, you may notice tantalizingly little spots that are blacked out where he seemed to have decided on a name and then, nah, never mind. Um, the world was essentially limited. You know, he started, as he said, he started writing his first few chapters and said, geez, this is going to be a novel, not just a short story. And then he, he did his first map. And uh, it grew to have include Essos. Um, and in fact, this one. Uh, this was something he did at the start for the Lands of Ice and Fire collection of maps. His publisher came to him with this idea: we want to have uh, a map, a map of, of a map book collecting all of your, your maps. And he said, "Great, fine." And now, of course, Game of Thrones had already come out, and he had provided them his initial world map. And um, if you look there on the east side of the map, the far eastern section. Uh, he scratched out that because he changed his mind about how that all looked. So if you pay attention to the, to the opening of A Game of Thrones, they still show that and the poster they sell still shows this shape of the continent. He ended up changing it to something more like this. Um, as he said, you know, he had moved to some islands further south and the whole, the whole far east is radically changed. So it's a malleable landscape, um, as this shows initially, and Westeros was much more settled in George's mind. It was it was the main place of the action. Essos was an area of you know, here be dragons. It was an area where, uh, and in fact, what, what happened actually is when they told them, well, let's, we want to make your maps into some posters. They said, great, here's the map, and then they said, okay, George, you know what? We did the Essos map, and it's basically a big white space with a few cities on the coast. And then, but the fracky sea, and it's empty otherwise. Like it, we, that's not going to make a great map. So George ended up, and I was, I was in, I was coming back from London for a Game of Thrones junket. I think for the third or fourth season, and suddenly I started getting all these mails with new scans of more maps, where George has started filling in all the blanks for Essos, uh, creating all these places and giving little notes, like you know, the city of the winged men. Uh, people claim, you know, they're so far to the east that there's just rumors about these men who allegedly can fly, and um, the, the 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 bleeding sea that uh, has an algae that turns red, and and all these uh, remarkable things. Um, so by fleshing it out for the lands of ice and fire, which is a very, you know, it was it was a commercial project, but it basically just led to all these new ideas. Then we come to the Royal Ice of Fire, where we start finishing it up, and George had inadvertently expanded how much work had to be done. By creating all these things for the Lands of Ice and Fire, he suddenly had to explain them all in the world book. So those one or two sentences explaining each of the summer aisles suddenly became longer sections, uh, and they encouraged his ideas for explaining how various places uh, came to be. For example, the Isle of Women. The Isle of Women on the Summer Isles, I didn't really think much of it when George first put it there. But then he wrote the history of Nemiria and the 10,000 ships, and it was a very different history than we imagined. And the Isle of Women was explained that at one point, the winner <coughs> fleeing the Valyrians, they went on a, a sort of almost Moses-like wandering around trying to find a home. And they settled for a brief time on this island. And since Nemiria was mostly accompanied by women, the island you know, became known as the Isle of Women until they went on somewhere else, ultimately ending up in Dorne. Um, in fact, so the question is, 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 when you have a map and you have these vistas, and you're wondering, what is that? What is, you know, what, what is it when there's a Carcosa? What does that mean? What is that place? What, are, what is Yi Ti like? Uh, you start thinking about the horizons, you start thinking about the edges and the mysteries, and the mystery is a thing that George thinks is very powerful. Uh, he has a, story, a short story called um, With Morning Comes Mistfall, which is a science fiction story but it's all about the idea that there's something precious in having mysteries and there's something terrible when you solve a mystery and it's no longer a mystery because it's no longer magical. Um, but we think George has managed very well to make Westeros magical. Uh, earlier this year, we att I attended uh, the, an art exhibition in Berlin 
40 artists, over 80 pieces of art inspired by the world of ice and fire. These, many of these artists work on Game of Thrones and, this, and they just, out of love, out of, out of uh, inspiration from what they saw, this is the five forts, something that no one had ever heard of before George started noodling more of his map. Um, here is a, a Valyrian explorer trying to find the southern edge of Sephorios, uh, and never, she spends three years flying and she never reaches its end. And it's not just professionals, not just artists. Uh, this is a fan artist uh, who was, used to be on our forum who did this magnificent, wonderful map which borrows from a kind of um, medieval language, a kind of a, a, a full medieval style and featuring all the heraldry. Um, and here, uh, just recently, we were in Stockholm for a talk and a fan came to us and presented us this cross-stitched map that she had been working on for two years at this stage, and I wasn't done yet, trying to fill it all in, and then, you know, if having a poster of Middle Earth on your, on your wall showed how much you loved Tolkien's work, I, I can't imagine how much love people are feeling to spend two years doing something like this. So we've talked a lot about world building now, and it obviously is one way to engage and carry away the reader into this other world that you've created. But it is impossible for an author to completely replicate the amount of detail and scale and size that you know, goes into an actual world. Not everything is going to be there. And the same is obviously true for George. So when we were working on the world of ice and fire and curating all the existing information, um, we certainly discovered that there were gaps in the world building, and some of them were filled in through the world of ice and fire. Others, because it wasn't really an area that George felt mattered to uh, the story or that he was interested in, were perhaps less, a little less filled out. Um, one, I believe it's Hemingway, right, who talks about the, the iceberg where the author has to know all this information about his world, but you're only presenting the tip of the iceberg sorry, to the reader because you don't want to overload them with information, but they have to have the sense that it is built on something more. Uh, George has effectively created the illusion of an iceberg under the searched surface. Uh, he described it like this. Uh, you know, most authors like to pre pre pretend that they're Tolkien's keeping manuscripts uh, and ma ma more manuscripts about the world creation, but it's generally not the case. Tolkien was the exception. It's not an iceberg, it's more like a float onto which the writer has piled uh, a bit of ice, uh, and when he needs the iceberg to look taller, he'll add a bit more ice, basically. So there isn't always that much under the surface if you happen to look in the wrong places. For example, uh, he has been telling an anecdote about a person who was interested in linguistics who contacted him and said, you know, I'm fascinated by your Valyrian language. Could you perhaps send me your dictionary or if you have a grammar or something like that? And George had to respond, I've created eight words in high Valyrian. When I need the ninth, I will create it. Um, <laughs> Now, of course, there is a grammar for Dothraki, at least, so in that sense, it has expanded beyond what George did in the hands of an actual linguist, but that can show how effective the illusion is. Um, and finally, I thought we would take a look at one of the things that George does to create uh, the sense of wonder, one of his particular favorites, which is to turn things up to 11, uh, is a way of both making it fantastical and differentiating Westeros from our world. And this is where history really meets fantasy. Um, the wall, for example, he's spoken a lot about how the wall is inspired by Hadrian's wall, about standing on that wall and looking north and thinking about how most those Roman legionaries have felt thinking about the wild Picts up there. Uh, 
It's just that he decided to add a few hundred feet and make it magical and made of ice, just churning it up to 11 a little bit. And you, other examples would be you know, the Titan of Bravos being ba based on the Colossus of Rhodes, for example, the High Tower based on the, uh, the Pharaohs of Alexandria, but much, much taller, much, much more fantastical. So he really likes making them larger than life, uh, sometimes a little too large. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, he, he's had second thoughts about how tall the wall is at 700 feet. Uh, when I visited him, I got the chance to visit him, uh, visit with him the uh, filming during the first season, and we were being driven out to Macmahorn Quarry in Northern Ireland, where Castle Black is filmed. And as we're driving up this winding road, and I can see it, this huge cliff, and he's like, you know, Elio, Elio, how, how tall do you think that is, from like the, the lake all the way to the top? And I said, I don't know, three, four hundred feet? And he said, it's exactly, it's four hundred feet. I made the wall too tall. <laughs> he didn't realize, in his, in his mind's eye, 700 sounded like, you know, lots of sevens show up in, his, in, the, in the series, so he thought it sounded great, but he didn't realize it's too big. It's, it's bigger than he imagined. Um, Paris told him under no circumstances was he going to change it after the fact. And um, there's also the Iron Throne. The Iron Throne, as you can see, this is George's vision, ideal vision. This is the closest anyone's ever done, gotten to making it. Obviously, the Iron Throne of the show is very nice, very practical for it to be taken in and out when they're you know, rebuilding the set, but it's much smaller. George wanted this monstrosity of, of, of twisted steel uh, where the king could look down on everybody. And so they got Mark Simonetti, a great artist, to work on it. And Simonetti would send him a rendering of it. And George would say, it's nice, but more swords, more swords. And so Simonetti would try it again, and he'd send it back. And mm, not quite there, more swords. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you, anyone remembers when the Queen of England visited the set, and they kind of sort of tried to nudge her to sit on the throne, but uh, it was not protocol for the queen to sit on any throne but her own. Uh, fortunately, she did not have to risk that one, because then, you know, we might have been risking the Queen of England, and we wouldn't want to do that now, would we? But yes, more swords is perhaps probably a good point to uh, conclude this on, because uh, that, that kind of sums up some of what George has been about these last uh, decades. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, enlightening uh, speech, and, and I think we have time for questions. some questions. If very happy to. Yeah. Uh, mm, Miguel, ahí Peter, por ejemplo, arriba. Okay, uh, hi. Um, I've, uh, thanks very much for that. That's absolutely like, really interesting, you know, just seeing the process behind. Um, if you don't mind, I've got one uh, kind of slightly more serious question and one that I'm, I'm really sorry is going to be a little bit of a fanboy question. Okay. Okay. We're all fanboys, I think. <laughs> so uh, I'll start off with the more serious, more academic one, which was... Um, uh, quite a few of us, we were discerning in the Game of Thrones and the Worlds of Ice and Fire that it's um, also in dialogue with fantasy writing in some way, as a, you know, not just the history. Um, we were kind of picking up things like uh, Gene Wolfe, uh, Jack Vance, Michael Moorcock, um, etc. Was that uh, ever, you know, part of uh, your brief when you were looking at the, the worlds of ice and fire? Were you becoming aware of that as well, or was that discussed in it? 
Yeah, I mean, we were, uh, we, you know, one of the first interactions we had with George was when he found, you know, we contacted him for about a game we wanted to make, and we started doing the heraldry. And he sent us the heraldry notes. And we started to notice that some of the houses that he was creating, some of their arms were a little suggested, like house bands with um, two eyes inside a golden ring and an, a dragon. And, and I, I had started reading Dying Earth, and I recognized that. So I think he's got, uh, he got House Garner for Alan Garner. He's got House uh, Rogers for uh, Roger Zelazny, his, his uh, departed friend. So George was always in dialogue with some of the other writers, making little nods to them. There are people who have discerned nods to comic books inside the novels. And uh, The World by Sapphire was no different. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, of course, looms very large Kadaf. in the eastern sections. That's very deliberate by George. Now, the, those Far East stuff, uh, we were curators. We didn't, we, you know, we collected information, we synthesized and put it together. But anything that's like really new, new, so that, that's George 100%. He, he wanted to have that in there. And certainly Vance as well, looking at when he wanted to have things that felt I mean, he felt the freedom when he was uh, fleshing out the things in, in Essos in particular. The further away, he felt the more fantastical it can be because it could just be stories, it could just be rumors. So I think we can certainly recognize a lot of, as I said, Lovecraft and also Vance in how he describes things and sort of a little bit more outlandish aspects of fantasy that he introduced there. But uh, that for us, it was mostly a matter of... Uh, Again, you know, when he sent the material, reading that and like, oh, uh, what's he referencing here? And uh, what are we discovering from this? Because it had uh, been a bit of a, you know, a, a game with the heraldry. I, I can say it was always very interesting to uh, discover those little nods mm. and things. Uh, there was, of course, also some thinking about other fantasy when we decided how uh, to do the uh, World of Ice and Fire, because actually we brought up uh, the, uh, the companion book that was done for, for Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time as an example of, look, here we have an in-world narrator who's got uh, not an omniscient point of view, so he can introduce errors if he wants, and he, they can have a limited knowledge. So uh, we, ha we had looked at some of other books that had been done as companion books as inspiration to see what could be done. Okay, thank you. And the, 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 the fanboy question is simply a three-word question. <laughs> Oily black stone. <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that's, uh, that's all George. And uh, we have our speculation, but he... Yeah, he's, he's never talked about he, it. We, we, no, we, we didn't ask. We saw it. We knew it was one of those things where he would just smile and not answer. <laughs> so. so I should expect no payoff on that. Uh, I am, but that that's one of those elements where George is making. To me, it's a nod to to like the, the mysteries of the world, mm. uh, but it's not necessarily something for Sunrise and Fire to uh, be a part of. He, he he answered a comment. Uh, was it, it may have been on that, or it may have been on something similar when we did a talk with him in Stockholm in 2015, and where he very clearly said that there are things that I really don't want to explain the whole world because it's kind of like the explorers of old who would venture out not knowing what they would find. You don't know what's behind that next hill in the, this unknown country. And he wanted to keep an element of that to keep people, to, to keep people wanting, to keep people wanting to explore and said, so that there is a mystery left. But I would love to know, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. So um, you were talking about this defamiliarization and uh, reality, uh, like the fantasy is more real than the reality. So, um, also in respect to my kind of research, yeah. so what, what, what's kind of, what does this world kind of uh, invoke in most people here that they kind of like, they're so immersed in it that they want to like be at this, all those, go to those locations. There are 10,000 tower houses in Northern Ireland, but they all, all want to visit exactly those two tower houses, uh -huh. where they, but now it's Winterfell or the Twins. 
and uh, it's what, what I mean it's probably a big question here mm. but why is exactly this world why did this world in your opinion hit the zeitgeist so hard um, that that's a great question I mean zeit, uh, the zeitgeist like uh, to me I, there, you always have this idea like it's just a time for this thing to happen and it's like there's a mystery to why I think when we talk about it through the vision, the lens of Game Game of Thrones, which is what how most people came to know it. I mean, um, you know, George has referenced before Game of Thrones ever came out how uh, the Eyrie was inspired by uh, Neuschwanstein Castle, and I don't know of anyone who said, "Oh, I, I plan a trip to Germany just to see Neuschwanstein Castle," because George referenced that the Eyrie is kind of like it. Game of Thrones, that visual thing, and forming that being a thing like the water cooler effect, where everyone could have a a cultural moment that they could share and, and discuss. I think that reinforces itself. That's how the fandom gets created. And then suddenly, when you got this swelling up of interest, you then get people wanting to go and see these things because it's a way to expand and, and increase their, their involvement in this thing they love. Um, prior to the TV show, what made us love it was, you know, it, for all you can say about world building, um, no amount of lore will hide, it will fix a bad novel, right? It will not make a terribly written book interesting. So at the end of the day, it's the writing, it's the writing that really sells it. It's the, it's the novel that gets you engaged, but then, and then the fact that you're engaged in the story, you become engaged in the world that comes along with it. Does that help? Yeah. I think it's also the balance, because we had a lot of people on the forum early on who would say, I don't generally like fantasy, but I like this. And that effect certainly happened for the TV show as well, which I think has to do a lot with how the two elements are put together. The, the familiar medieval-ish world and the added fantasy elements that are generally at the beginning carefully introduced and become a natural extension of the world. So those who would have balked at another fantasy world, no matter how good the story was, were still drawn in. And it gave them, um, and of course, the amount of characters. I think the, uh, the large number of point of views has always been one of the key strengths of the story, giving you so many different ways to experience the story in a way, so many different inroads into the story. If one character did not work for you, another probably would, and you would be, you would be experiencing the world of Westeros in, from several different angles, essentially, and very likely that quite a few of them would, would grip you. Thank you very much. I, I, since we started a little bit later, we I think that we are going to accept two or, two or three more questions. Okay, so Nestor, thank you, Miguel. Um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for coming. I think that uh, in fact uh, all of us here are fanboy. <laughs> So we are really happy, and I have two um, two questions. Uh, first one, I know you are a little bit angry, especially Elio, with the <laughs> with the show, the way the show is finishing uh, on the plot. But um, what's the the best thing that the show has done, uh, in your opinion? Is uh, the first question, and the second, uh, what about the the unknown uh, continents? Althos, Authorios, and the supposed uh, Western uh, continent that we have um, read about in uh, Fire and Blood. Uh, so the best thing the show has done, I mean, as, as the, I stopped watching at the end of the fifth season, I, I just didn't, I couldn't take it anymore. But um, <laughs> the best thing it's done is made a lot more people familiar with the books. I think that's that's great. But uh, they've, uh, you know, the production values. I can't take away. You know, uh, the first time Daenerys flew on Drogon's back, I, I I'd I like a dragon, around. please. Yeah, dragons. Yeah. So that 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 was great. But mostly it's the fact that people love the books. Um, 
as the Sephorios and uh, Sephorios and, and the supposed Western continent, these are all part of the mystery. It's it's the thing beyond the horizon, um, and and I couldn't speculate too much about. I, I don't think George ever plans to expand on them. They're always going to be just just beyond the edge of your knowledge, tantalizing. Uh, I mean, there there was always that tantalizing possibility of somebody going out west at least at, at some point but I think probably is certainly not going to fit within the narrative of A Song of Ice and Fire at least uh, um, that would probably need another book then to uh, to explore that uh, maybe George was tempted for a while to have somebody going out there but for the, certainly Sotorius and Ultos are definitely supposed to be uh, uh, beyond the known world, that is definitely where it might be more dragons lurking or, or whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm the trash. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, yes. Thank you very much for this great uh, exposition you have made, and it's very exciting to have you here. I just wanted to ask one question because you have talked a lot, a lot about world building and I have a teacher who always tells me that the, you can't tell when a world is well, well built because you put down the book but the world is still going on. You feel that there are still stories to tell, that the world is still alive within the book and to me this is something that was very special about George Martin's world because it really feels like it has that element of aliveness of, the, you know that even yes. when the story ends, even when the last book comes out and we close down the last page, it will, there will still be things going on. And I just wanted to ask you what element is it that you feel that is the most important in achieving this effect, in achieving this sensation for readers that this world is not just a paper a scenario created for a very specific story but something that has a life on its own I do think a lot of that has to do with that illusion of the gigantic iceberg below the surface that he drops little details about the world um, all through the book I mean we one of the first projects that we had was to create the concordance that Elio created which was going through and noting down all pieces of facts about the world. And they're interwoven into the story in such a way that it's not like an info dump of material on you, but you get little bits of information about the story, or about the world, all the time. And I think that it builds it up in your mind as being even more than there actually is. And you get these little references to to history, for example, I think the, the, the fake history and the in-world history become particularly important in making the world seem like it has a life of its own because you get the sense that, yes, it goes back 10,000 years at least, uh, so of course it's going to be here. 10,000 years from now as well. When you see it far back into the history, you expect that these people are at one point going to be part of history as well. In 200 years, somebody's going to be writing the chronicles about you know, Daenerys Targaryen, perhaps, and what happened when she came to Westeros. So um, that, that is part of that. I think it, it is a very effective to some extent it is an illusion, but it is, it is very effective in that it, crea it opens up your imagination and your mind fills in all the little gaps that there are and just feels like this is a fully fleshed out real world that has, as you say, a life of its own. Thank you very much. Aquí Miguel. Um, thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, when you talked about the magic system and how you introduced it little by little in the books, when we look at historical accounts in Westeros and Essos, we actually see, or it seems at least, that there was much more magic before than it is now in the time of the books, because there were more dragons and the wall, white walkers, etc. And it seems like the book starts as a point where magic is practically disappeared, mm -hmm. and then it starts rebuilding bit by bit again. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there was 
a specific reason for that that we don't know yet, or if it was just a device in order to introduce it, the magic bit by bit, as you've said? I think uh, certainly George has explicitly said that it was a bit of a device. He wanted to start low and then build as it went. But it's clearly it's part of some aspect of the cosmology of the world that something happened now. Uh, it's been mentioned that um, uh, the pyromancers say that the wildfire became less effective after the, the last dragon died and then it becomes suddenly much more effective again. And uh, Halley and the pyromancer wondered if there were dragons again uh, which we know to be the case. Uh, Maester Lewin referred to the Doom of Valyria as ending uh, magic. So George has some ideas about how, he doesn't have a formal system, but he clearly has some very rough rules or, or guidelines for himself for how it works. I think part of the history of the world is a history of the magic going away and now there being a resurgence. Of course, we don't know if it is a permanent resurgence as such because we have uh, Leaf talking about how the, the, the creatures of the, you know, the, the old world are slowly disappearing and talking about how eventually the dire wolves will also be disappearing and, and uh, not just that they're driven, being driven away by the humans, but there's a bit of that fading, uh, obviously similar there to, to Tolkien's the fading of magic in Middle Earth and the elves going away and it becoming a different age, an age of just man. Thank you very much. Somebody else? Tough talk. Uh, first of all, congratulations because it was amazing as always. Uh, you have talked a lot of times about how George was develop, developing the world. When he started creating the history, there were no black fires, for example. In the first of the Duncan Egg uh, novellas, there is no mention to the black fires. In the, even in the first black fire rebellion, happened just a couple of years before. So George was inventing the story uh, during the years. And some critics have said that the world has become too big that George should, should, should be more humble, should have created a, a smaller world, and with a smaller world, a less rich world, the books will already be finished, and we then be watching what we are watching now in the TV show. So uh, what is your answer to those critics that, that say that George was too ambitious and created a work so big that he, that he wasn't able to finish the novels on time? Uh. I think the eighth season is a testament to his ma having made a world of the right size and when he was questioned by Benioff and Weiss and they went a different direction, people have seen the result of that. So uh, whether he'll ever finish it, I cannot say. He's working on it, but um, whenever, when people say, oh, I've seen recently, oh, it should have just been a trilogy of books. Uh, well, I mean, the trilogy we have, the first three books that everyone absolutely adores, came out of someone who started a three book series and then made it a four book series and then a six book series. Um, the growth of the world went hand in hand with how good those books are. The problem of course is wrapping it up. There's a certain point where, and that's what George is working on, but it seems clear that certain of the elements that he introduced in say A Dance of Dragons were elements that are actually really integral to his vision and uh, the failure to follow that uh, has is part of what a lot of critics are, are commenting on. Thank you. Well, I I think we have to yeah. to stop now because uh, we have uh, other comfort, uh, other talks yes. coming. And but I would like to thank you again. It's been wonderful to to listen to you. And please another round of applause. Thank you very much.